Welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. Our segment this month is Constellations and Star Lore of Winter. With me here in the studio to discuss this fascinating topic is John Schroer. John, welcome back to the program. Nice to be here, Don. Thank you. Well, we're going to talk about stars and constellations and a number of other interesting things out in the universe. Where do you want to start? Well, we're going to start uh, this uh, for the wintertime with the brightest constellation that we can see in the entire night sky from Michigan. And that's going to be Orion the Mighty Hunter. You know, the guy with the belt. Right. Uh, the first image I'd like to show you is a, uh, a map of Orion the Hunter. This was sold in a set of cards um, um, in London approximately two centuries ago. Um, where the arm where Orion is holding the club, that is the bright star Betelgeuse. It actually translates into uh, armpit of the great one. It's a, it's a translation and a cluttering of the original Arabic name. The other arm is holding the lion's skin shield, which is represented by a set of uh, a line, a curving line of stars. Uh, the three stars in Orion's belt, and from the belt um, hangs a sword. Now, if we take a small telescope, a backyard telescope, and aim underneath the belt, you can see this. Um, the beautiful white and kind of reddish structure you see is the Orion Nebula. Uh, thanks to views from many telescopes, including the Hubble Space Telescope, we know it's a um, a giant cloud or nebula, and it's actually a star nursery. Brand new stars are forming in there. Just above it, um, I mean immediately above it, you'll see M43, which is another small bright nebula being lit by stars. That's the bluish one up above the, the red? No, directly above oh, the red. Oh, that, okay. And then higher up at the top of the screen, you'll see what is nicknamed the uh, Running Man Nebula. If you look at it closely, it looks like a guy jogging across the sky. I see. All now, right. Ryan's got the brightest stars, and the belt is very, very useful because with it you can find uh, two other great constellations in the sky. Now, the, the, the story goes that Orion the hunter was a great hunter, and he swore an oath that uh, he would pursue and hunt down all the animals on the earth. Now, the story is that Maya, uh, Gaia, who is the goddess of, of, of nature, was very upset with this, and she entered into a conspiracy with Scorpius, the scorpion, to stop Orion. She took the scorpion to Orion's home in the woods of ancient Greece. He snuck into Orion's tent at night and stung him. Now, um, Orion became very ill. His friends went out and found a doctor, and uh, the doctor was able to heal Orion. Um, the doctor found the scorpion and killed him, and Orion, when told that he had been stung by a scorpion, was confused because scorpions are desert creatures. What were they doing in the Greek forest? So then he began to think that maybe he shouldn't be killing off all the animals of the earth. And so he became a game warden and protector of animals. Eventually, when he died, he was placed by Zeus up among the stars. Well, Gaia uh, pled the case of the scorpion. The scorpion gave his life to stop Orion. So the scorpion was also placed amongst the stars but on the opposite part of the sky. That means you can see Scorpius the scorpion in the summertime. And you'll never see Orion and the scorpion in the same nighttime sky. Very interesting. Now, the next stop, we're going to take Orion's belt and draw a line upward and to the right until you see Taurus the bull. And we'll show a map or picture of Taurus up here on the screen here. He actually has two open or loose gathering of stars, open star clusters. The one that makes the letter V that forms the face of Taurus the bull is called the Hyades. Riding on his shoulders is one of the favorite objects for backyard astronomers to look at and those are known as the Pleiades. Here's the diagram. If you use Orion's belt and draw a line through the belt to the right, you can see the face of Taurus leading up to his horns. And then above that, further to the upper right, you can see the Pleiades. Now, what we're going to do here is show you an up-close photograph of the Pleiades. With the naked eye, you can see approximately six stars or so. But in a telescope with a good digital camera, you can see over 1,100 stars. You can also see a, a great deal of bluish haze, and that's the nebula from which all those stars form from. The heat of stars is now breaking that cloud apart. So that's a really beautiful and breathtaking sight. Now these Pleiades re represent the seven daughters of Atlas. That's correct, and the names are located on them. Now we're also going to show you another image, which will be a map of the Hyades. Now with the naked eye, we can see them as a letter V. But in this map, you can see there are many different stars in here. Now, all these belong to that 
open star cluster except for the one in the center left-hand side that says Aldebaran. That's a red giant star, and it is not part of the Hyades star cluster, but it's known as the Great Red Eye of the Bull. We just see it juxtaposed over that star cluster as a line of sight. That's absolutely correct. All right. All right. Our next stop is going to be taking you to one of Orion's companions. You use Orion's belt, and you draw a line down and to the left, and you will find Canis Major. We'll bring up the image. Canis Major is Orion's biggest dog. He has inside of him at the collar the brightest star you can see anywhere on the Earth at night. And this is Sirius, also known as the dog star. Now, Sirius is the brightest star. Now, stars are rated by magnitude between one, which is the brightest stars, down to the ones you can just barely see with your eyes, which is magnitude six. Sirius is a minus one, which means it's an incredibly bright star. It's also relatively close, about eight and a half light years away. In the neighborhood, so In the speak. neighborhood. That would translate to about 51 trillion miles or so from the Earth. It's a pretty long way off. Indeed. Um, now, you also saw in that picture uh, an image of a rabbit that lives underneath Orion, and that was Lepus the hare. And here you can see the picture. Now, we don't talk about Lepus that often because um, he has no really bright stars, like the big dog has Sirius. Interesting. Now, Orion has a second companion who's much younger, and his name is Canis Minor, the little dog or the puppy. We'll go ahead and bring up the picture of Canis Minor here if we have one. And he has one bright star and several faint ones called Procyon. Now because it looks like a bright star and a couple of dim ones forming a rather line, some people prefer not to call it the little dog. Some, some like me, but occasionally mention the planetarium that would be renamed Canis Fervens for what its appearance, that would make it the constellation of the hot dog. I knew you'd work that one in. Well, I'm not sure if our audience will relish that or not, but we'll see. Where do we go from the little dog? Well, those feature, uh, the next one is going to be Gemini the twins, and they are sitting above Orion and Taurus the bull. They feature two bright stars marking the heads of the twins, uh, Castor and Pollux. Legend of Gemini goes that Castor was born first, and he was born to be an immortal, and his favorite sport was, uh, was wrestling. Now, Cast, uh, Pollux, the younger brother, was into boxing, and he was born mortal. He could die. The story goes that he entered the, one of the first Olympics in ancient Greece, and what happened was that he was so badly injured in a boxing match, which had very few rules, that he actually died. Now, in ancient Greece, people believe that when someone died, their soul went to the underworld, which was ruled by Hades. And um, Castor was just totally unhappy in missing his brother terribly. So he went to the temple of Zeus and he prayed to the chief of the Greek god for permission to die so his soul could join his brothers in the underworld. No immortal had ever asked this of Zeus. And Zeus was so totally taken aback by this request, he was moved to compassion for the two brothers. So he traveled to Hades, brought Pollux's spirit out, and he carried them both and placed them um, up there amongst the stars so they could always be together. And you can see in that picture, um, they're standing side by side. Now, if we go back, um, the next picture we're going to show you is an actual photograph of the stars in Gemini, the twins. Castor and Pollux are in the upper left of the screen, and you will see a beautiful collection of stars on the lower right. And this is M35. This is a beautiful open cluster, a loose gathering of stars underneath the feet of uh, Gemini the twins. In fact, that whole area at the bottom of the feet is, in fact, the area of the winter Milky Way in our nighttime sky. Interesting. Now, this open cluster of stars, is this fairly close to us or farther away? Um, it's further away. It's a few thousand light years away, so it would be much farther journey than, say, going to Sirius. And this would be a beautiful sight to look at in uh, binoculars or a small telescope? That's right. Binoculars would give you a nice 3D kind of view to it. A telescope would give you a closer view and you'll be able to see more of the stars. All right. Uh, are there other c constellations of interest here in our winter sky? Yeah. Also above Orion and Canis Minor, the little dog, is the constellation of Auriga the charioteer. Now, you may notice in this map from the London set of cards 
which they sold about 200 years ago, there is one bright star, and its name is Capella. And it's one of the most unusual stars we can see in the nighttime sky during any season. Why is that, John? Because of its color. It is an, a yellow star. So it's the same basic class or temperature as our own sun. It's the only yellow star that you can see in our sky anywhere, northern or southern hemisphere. That's amazing. You'd think we'd see more because of so many billions of billions of stars. That's true. If in a telescope, you might be able to see them, but the naked eye, that's the only yellow one that we can see. And uh, with that uh, picture we saw, we saw a person holding a goat. What's the significance of the goat? Well, Araiga the charioteer is um, from the Sumerian society. They're among the first civilizations on the earth. They domesticated the cow. They uh, organized farming. They actually have organized agriculture. And they took their grains and they made it into bread. But they also mixed it with sugar and yeast. And they let it brew for a while. And they turned it into beer. That's right. They invented beer. Great Any folks. guy out there, you should be very appreciative of the Sumerians. They also had their f the first form of writing. They carved uh, these symbols in the clay tablets called cuneiform. And we have much information about that civilization because their information was carved in these tablets, and many have survived to this day. Most people don't realize that Sumer, which was the great city of Sumerians, um, is located in the fertile valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates River. Which the is Fertile Crescent. Yes. The Fertile Crescent, which is located in Iraq. Right. So that's one of the first civilizations uh, on the earth. Now, Araiga was a chariot driver, and that was his favorite goat. And, um, and Capella marks the location of the goat. If you look just underneath uh, Capella, you'll see a small group of stars, and those are known as the children of the goat, or... The kids. The kids, absolutely right. Now, the, the last constellation that we're going to talk about in the winter nighttime sky is, um, is Cancer the Crab. He's the last constellation to appear. He's also got no bright stars. If you look carefully, it looks like a very faint up, down, 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 Y, but there is something rather nice in the middle, a beautiful cluster of stars known as Presepe, or it's known as the Beehive Cluster. Also looking very nice through binoculars, I assume? It most certainly is. Any open cluster or globular cluster is just a really nice um, eyeful to, uh, to enjoy in binoculars or a telescope. Now, are there resources for people to go to to help them locate these objects we've been talking about? And more. Yeah, there are a lot of, uh, of catalogs and star atlases and even astronomy programs that will run on your Macintosh or your Windows PC. Or if you're one of the rebels that uses Linux, um, there's programs for that as well. There are also a great deal of publications such as Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazines that come out on a monthly basis. And they have things such as Small Scope Wonders, which is uh, what you can look at in the sky with a small telescope or a good pair of binoculars. I also mentioned star atlases, and I want to show off this one here. We'll aim the other for the camera. And this is Will Terrian and Brian Skiff's Bright Star Atlas. Uh, and what this is, is this is a wonderful atlas that helps you find bright stars, constellations, and also um, deep sky objects like the nebula in Orion, the star clusters that are located in um, Canis Major and in Gemini, the twins. Uh, it's a really wonderful book, and it's only $9.95. And this is available for most bookstores or online. That's great, John. I know this will help our viewers uh, find some of these objects. Uh, that we've piqued their interest about. If you have a question that you'd like to send to us, please send it to us at our email address that we have for you there at the bottom of the screen. And don't go away, we'll be right back. Term of the month for January 2011, start of the new year, perihelion. Now perihelion is a term that means when a planet is closest in its orbit to the sun. Para means uh, close, and helion means the sun. Uh, these are Greek words, so, you know, it's all Greek to me. Um, this year, perihelion for the Earth occurs on the 3rd of January. So you'd think, well, the Earth is closest to the sun in January, so it should be warmer. And in fact, the Earth 
is warmer in January. But in, here in the Northern Hemisphere, the Earth is tilted away from the Sun. The Northern Hemisphere is tilted away from the Sun, and so it is colder. And this is a bigger effect than the distance that the Earth is from the Sun. So at perihelion, the Earth is about 91 million miles from the Sun. At aphelion, which is when it's at the farthest point from the Sun, that's at the one point there in the diagram, uh, the Earth is about 94 million miles away from the Sun. So at perihelion, the Earth is 3.4% closer and 7.9% hotter. But the tilt of the Earth makes up much more difference. So it's winter uh, right around this time. Term of the month for January 2011 is perihelion. The Great Lakes Association of Astronomy Clubs work with many sponsors to host our 14th annual Astronomy at the Beach. This short video clip will focus primarily on the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club's Beachside Astronomers. This year's Astronomy at the Beach featured a number of tables from vendors, Wayne State University, and many astronomy clubs. The camera mark table had quite a few telescopes on display. As we approached Maple Beach, we could see astronomers setting up their telescopes for evening viewing. Yellow balloons mark telescopes that could safely view the sun. Here's Doug Bauer, FAC president, setting up his bead telescope. Nearby others were already viewing the sun through their personal solar telescopes. Oh, it's not too well, okay. Yeah, let me loosen it. So you got a PST and a Vixen mount here? And a Vixen Sphinx SXW mount. And the mount's rated for 30 pounds. 30, yeah, 30. Uh, you can put more on it, but uh -huh. you get a little bit of wind. And Hi. What do, what do these mounts run, roughly? Uh, they're about uh, two grand new, but okay. uh, I bought this used for about uh, twelve. Oh, okay. Twelve hundred, not twelve thousand. Right. Twelve hundred. Uh huh. Uh huh. Very cool. Here's Steve Harbath standing near his Takahashi six-inch refractor. This telescope gives great views, and there's always a long line of visitors waiting to take a look through it. Members from other clubs brought their telescopes as well. Here we see a large reflector telescope with a twenty-inch mirror. This 8-inch home-built Dobsonian telescope was crafted in wood and has a matching wooden observing chair. This. You got baffles in here? Yeah. yeah. So you do binocular white light observing? No, no, not white light. This those, isn't white light. Those are filters. On there. Filters? Those okay. are solar filters. Okay. All right. Solar Otherwise filters. I'd go blind. Okay. And this is a parallelogram? Yes, here? sir. It is. Oh, okay. Very cool. And did you build this parallelogram yourself? Yes, I did. It's oh, great, very cool. great for star parties because kids can, you always know what the kid is looking at. Uh -huh. sure. Very cool. I like it. I need to build one of these for my uh, binoculars. But <laughs> that's well, a project. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper than buying one. I'll tell you. Yeah, they're expensive, aren't they? Yeah, they're yeah. a couple hundred bucks. I bet I don't have $20. The most expensive thing on this is the stainless steel hardware. Uh -huh. You know, the aluminum is cheap from. Most of us build out of scrap stuff from the neighborhood. Uh -huh. But the stainless steel was the most expensive thing. Uh -huh. If it ever comes out, you're welcome to look through it here. Okay. And these are, what, what, what power binoculars are these? These are uh, 10 by 70s. Uh -huh. 10, 10, by 70s. 10 power, yeah. Seven, seven, as you, uh, you have binoculars and you're aware that the light gathering capability is the important thing, right. not the power. Right. I wish they were a little bit more powerful. Mm -hmm. I can see the Jupiter's moons without any trouble, but I cannot see the, I cannot not see the rings of Saturn. Uh -huh. these. I can see Saturn's moon, Titan but I can't see the rings. Right. And you need about, I think, about 20 power probably to see the, mm -hmm. to see the, uh, the rings. Mm -hmm. Very cool.
I usually bring these out to star parties. I reserve the scope for when I go up north, you know, for for the not for the but for public awareness events I use these. Because people are, are amazed uh, when they come out here what they can see. Right. The first year we ever did this was when Hale Bop was out. Are you recording this? Yes. This Is must be right? awfully boring. Yes, <laughs> yes all right. Okay. Uh, the I first, can always edit it out. The first, first year we, we did this was when Hale Bop was out. And every uh, we did it here. Oh. And uh, everybody okay. walked by the binoculars. And then on the way out, they said, well, we might as well look through those. We've looked through everything else. And everybody, to a person, to a man, said, we should have come here and just stayed here because the field of view is so wide, you you can see everything. Whereas in a scope, as you know, it narrows it down and you can't see anything. Yeah. You can see the whole, uh, most most of the uh, the tail and, and and the coma. And here we go, here we go. If I don't blind myself finding it, here we go. Come and take a look, please, sir. And you'll see it's supposed. Poking, it looks like a moon rising is what it looks like. Okay. Come and take a look through this. Right. That's what we're here for, sir. You don't have to bend over. You just raise the whole thing up. Grab her down below and get it like that. And raise it up to your comfort. Oh, I see. Very good. Oh, no, there it is. This is an 11-inch Celestron. 11-inch Celestron, okay. Yes, and it's... Uh, and what, what type of mount is this? Is this the... It's an equatorial mount. Let me okay. show you. I, I point this at the North Star, uh -huh. which is right up about there right now. Okay. And I know that because I've got a compass. Uh -huh. And it's set for the latitude where we are here in Michigan. So I point this at the North Star, and there's a motor drive in here. Mm -hmm. And what this does is turn the whole telescope once every 24 hours. Okay. So it keeps up with the rotation of the Earth. If I didn't do that, I'd lose the target in about 30 seconds. Okay. Any target I'd have in here, I lose in about 30 seconds. So it's nice. It keeps it keeps up with the rotation of the Earth. Milton, you got like many eyepieces here. What is this? Set this down is here? my um, as of about six weeks ago, my latest edition. This wow. is it's called a uh, turret. Wow. Uh, Paul Van Syke, I think is his name, out of uh, Boulder, Colorado, does it. I'm, I'm pleased with it, really. Uh, I'm not fooling around with eyepieces anymore at home, and I'm, I'm going out, I can set it because I got it all stuck together. Right. I can just set this thing up, you know, and just look at, say, if I want to go look at one planet, take it in, five minutes, I'm done. You're looking at it through a very red filter with one angstrom of bandwidth. That means it's from 6,562 to 6,563 angstroms. It's, it's, it's very, very narrow. It's like the reddest and purest red filter you'll ever see. Hi, everyone. This is Don Claser. I'm from the Detroit Science Center. and We have our portable planetarium, Star Lab, with us here today and tomorrow at uh, Astronomy at the Beach. It's pretty good.
Hi, this is John Shore with January's What's Up in the Nighttime Sky. We'll start off with the moon, which will be a new moon on January the 4th. That means you won't be able to see it because it will be hidden between the Earth and the Sun. On the 12th of January, we'll see the first quarter of the moon. And if you look along that line between daylight and darkness, you'll get some great views of craters and mountains sticking up into the rising sun. Because in that line, you're looking at dawn. Uh, the full moon will be on January the 19th, and we'll conclude the month with the third quarter moon, which will be on the 26th. Now, during this time of year, being wintertime, one of the great things we can look at and appreciate the night sky is the constellation of Orion the Hunter. Now, Orion is known for the three stars that mark its belt, the bright red star on his shoulder, which is known as Betelgeuse, also known as the armpit of the Great One. It's also famous for a beautiful glowing cloud, which is a birthplace of brand new stars. This is the Orion Nebula. To the naked eye, it'll seem like a very large fuzzy star located below the three stars of the belt. Now, if you use Orion's belt, you can follow it to the right and upward. And in this next picture, we'll be able to show you Taurus the Bull, featuring the bright red star Aldebaran and a group of stars known as the Hyades. Aldebaran is not part of that open star cluster. Continue that line through Orion's belt past the Hyades, and you will find the famous Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. In Japan, this is known as Subaru. Now, concerning the planets in the night sky, the only planet that's going to be visible for most of the early evening will be Jupiter. And you'll see it in this shot over here in the western sky. Uh, and you'll see here it's not far from the moon at the middle of the month. That'll be between the first quarter and the full moon. The other planet that's visible will be later on in the evening, and that's going to be Saturn on the opposite side of the sky, located just above Spica, the bright blue star of spring in the constellation of Virgo the Maiden. Now, the planet Uranus is also going to be in the sky very, very close to the planet Jupiter. So what you have to do is have a good telescope, and you'll be able to see it. It'll be there basically through the winter time. And Neptune, which is not moving very fast, in fact, it just finished its first orbit since it was discovered back in 1841, it'll be in the constellation of Capricornus. I also want to mention that January the 3rd is perihelion, and that's when the Earth is closest to the Sun. You'll hear more about that in the term of the month from Steve Witte. Well, that's what's up for January 2011. I hope you have a wonderful year, and please, if you haven't done so, go out and look at the night sky. It's the best free show.